here we go. Oops. So welcome to the first uh, monthly grand rounds for physical therapy uh, and rehabilitation professions. So the idea is through, throughout this to have different speakers from different professions, uh, physician, PT, OT, athletic training, to try to really get the gamut of rehabilitation professions. Um, I'm Steve Karaha, and today we're going to be talking about treatment-based classification for non-operative management of shoulder pain. I have nothing to uh, disclaim. I have no financial uh, relationships to disclose. Today's uh, objectives, we're looking at, to identify relevant pathanatomic diagnostic groups for non-operative management. We're also looking at the key components of patient history and physical examination for irritability, as well as impairments that help really help guide rehabilitation. Lastly, we're looking to apply the stage, uh, stage approach for rehabilitation, or the star shoulder, to guide rehabilitation. So to start out, shoulder pain is the third most common musculoskeletal problem, and it can uh, present with pain, functional loss, and disability. And the really big problem here is most people who have it, about 50% of them, I think the uh, most recent research was 61% had pain even after one year. So this represents a significant problem that is costly to the uh, medical system. Traditional diagnosis uh, is based upon the pathoanatomic medical model, which is aimed at identifying pathologic tissues. And they've done a lot of work publishing regarding diagnostic accuracy based upon these pathoanatomic diagnoses. Uh, these, they've used tests to identify rotator cuff tenor and tendinopathy, adhesive capsulitis, glenohumeral anterior instabil instability, slap lesions, and numerous others. Implicit in this model is that patients with the same pathology should be managed in essentially the same way and have similar prognoses, and that the diagnosis remains constant, static over the episode of care. However, we really know that when we are guiding people through non-operative rehabilitation, signs and symptoms often change throughout an episode of care, which requires modification of, inter of the intervention. And it also may change the prognosis. The pathoanatomic model also implies that pathology explains the patient's symptoms and disability, so activity limitations and participation restrictions, and that correcting the pathology will improve the symptoms and disability. And that's excellent. Although the pathoanatomic system of diagnosis may be very appropriate for surgical decision making, mainly because when, when you're doing surgery, you're correcting pathoanatomy, you're correcting the anatomy. There likely exists a heterogeneous group of patients who have different or varying degrees of impairment, loss of body structure or function, and pain that warrant different rehabilitation strategies. Furthermore, recent evidence is really showing more and more that there's a poor relationship between pathoanatomic classification or diagnosis and the best available interventions, non-operative interventions. And I do say that repetitively because when you're doing surgery or having, sending somebody for a surgical consult, pathoanatomy is extremely important. Non-operatively, maybe less so. So, Case in point here. Based on impingement tests, a painful arc, and pain with isometric resistive testing, you have two different patients. Patient A, acute pain, high levels of pain from a recent overuse. They were painting in their house, doing a lot of overhead activity, changing a lot of light bulbs. Patient B, chronic pain, low levels of pain, and really it's aggravated mostly when uh, you have prolonged or strenuous overhead activity. But otherwise, they're generally OK. But this is really starting to get to them. They also have identifiable posterior shoulder tightness and scapular weakness. So again, using those three tasks, great. They have positive Hawkins, positive uh, painful arc, 
painful and weak external rotation resistance. Based upon those three positive tests, both of those patients have about a 95% chance of having rotator cuff pathology, even without an MRI. Okay, you get an MRI, you can kind of confirms that. Excellent. Patient A, you initially uh, address with activity modification, ice, anti-inflammatory medication, pain-free range of motion exercise, and consider possibly a subacromial injection. Patient B, on the other hand, you'd put a little bit more emphasis on frequent prolonged posterior shoulder stretching, scapular muscle strengthening with resistance to fatigue. Additionally, patient A's symptoms and signs may even change over the episode, and once you get their uh, higher levels of pain down, they may resemble more of those of patient B with specific impairments to be identified later. In both cases, the diagnosis of rotator cuff pathology can be supported and is true. And it remains accurate over that episode of care. However, the specific pain, symptoms, and impairments dictate a very different treatment approaches. So there's two predominant theories about subchromial pain, and I'm only going to go into this a little bit because this is a more overarching talk. But looking at tendon overload and degeneration, mechanical compression uh, in the subchromial space. And, you know, it, it's, it would be great. And originally when um, Hawkins and Nier came out with their testing, the whole idea was that it's a mechanical compression. And I think we all realized that if subchromial pain was only from mechanical compression, all patients would benefit from acromioplasty. Well, that makes sense. You take off the roof, you give it more space, all of a sudden it gets better. But we do find uh, numerous studies in 93, 99, 2005, and 2006 show that acromioplasty does not help all patients. It helps. I'm not arguing that it helps. But it doesn't help all patients. So bony pathology is not the only mechanism. Again, pathology is important. I am not arguing that point at all, but I am saying it's not the only thing. So, something's missing. Pathoanatomic classification may partially enable rehabilitation decision making through the application of tissue healing principles that guide treatment decisions and prognosis. For example, the pathoanatomic diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis indicates treatment to restore shoulder range motion, right? And that recovery is typically pro, uh, protract, prolonged over numerous months to possibly years. However, it doesn't indicate which shoulder motions are impaired, nor does it indicate the appropriate intensity of treatment. And there's a lot of argument that if you push too hard, and I completely agree with this, if you push too hard, you end up hurting them. And you have to more guide them through. Likewise, a patient is sustaining a bank heart lesion would, su uh, would suggest an initial period of limiting external orientation range of motion, but wouldn't fully inform rehabilitation interventions directed towards uh, potential concomitant impairments such as weakness or, weakness or poor scapular control. So inconsistent relationships between tissue pathology and impairments limit the sole use of pathoanatomy in decision making in rehabilitation. So, since pathoanatomic diagnosis can't fully direct the intensity and specific intervention tactics, we, this system is actually proposed to integrate pathoanatomy, symptom irritability, and specific impairments. The concepts of tissue irritability and identification of specific impairments will uh, presumably more effectively guide intervention to result in improved outcomes as well as reducing costs. So primary purposes of the classification systems in general, guide decision treatment, uh, treatment decision making, and inform prognosis. So in order to do that, you need all those pieces in there. 
Additionally, it's important for communication. So between payers, healthcare providers, researchers, and people utilizing the research findings such as you and me. So in order to accomplish this, you need mutually exclusive groupings. And uh, you need to be able to identify these subgroups within a, an overall population. So you need some identifiers and you need subclassifications. And I will say there are multiple classification systems out there for the shoulder. The problem with those is they're either not mutually exclusive or they're not complete or they really don't help guiding rehabilitation. Uh, there's some that are just solely based upon irritability. There's some that are just based upon pathoanatomy. Again, for surgical decision making, a little bit different story. But for non-operative rehabilitation, you need a little bit more uh, than just that. So there's a couple of different uh, classification systems out there. Obviously, as you can see, lumbar spine is much more studied. Um, they've been developed for the cervical spine and the lumbar spine. Interesting thing about the lumbar spine and the cervical spine, though, a lot of literature has actually shown more and more that pathoanatomy doesn't inform prognosis for those two. However, for the shoulder, it does inform prognosis. So it's important to include and keep including pathoanatomy in this classification system versus some of the cervical and lumbar spine. Now, granted, that's barring fracture and all that, uh, all the stuff that is more of a surgical decision-making process. Evidence does indicate uh, improved patient rated outcomes and uh, decreased costs for both the cervical spine and the lumbar spine. Uh, and this literature has been published throughout the country and especially for the lumbar spine throughout the world. So this, you're really not going to be able to see it well, it's not projecting very large, but uh, we'll go into uh, We'll go into things a little bit more in depth anyway, so you don't really have to see this. But the whole idea here is the, the overarching scheme is you're looking at screening first. Important in any clinical decision making process. Then looking at pathanatomic diagnosis and rehabilitation classification. Now, I will mention for simplicity, the authors of this paper in particular uh, chose to do it in a linear fashion, just because it's much simpler than looking at it overarching. More than likely, in real clinical decision making, you're looking at both pathoanatomic diagnosis, irritability, and impairments all at the same time. So it's not as linear as it looks here. So the again, the, the overarching thing is after appropriate screening, the pathoanatomic diagnosis is used to classify uh, patients in the stage classification system. Then the diagnosis is derived from a combination of history, specific special tests, and results from, from imaging if available. So prognosis, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, is still seemingly derived from pathoanatomy. Uh, and this is available in evidence from systematic reviews as, as well as practice guidelines, um, at least for the shoulder. Um, Rehabilitation classification is then utilized to focus and guide the intensity and specific interventions selection um, based off of the level of irritability and also based upon those specific impairments. So, history, screening. You're basically taking a history, uh, history and physical examination findings are used to determine the, if there are signs and symptoms consistent with a musculoskeletal problem, amenable to rehabilitation rather than a more serious condition requiring further assessment and medical care. As I had mentioned first, this is critical. The identification of red flags that may indicate a serious pathology such as tumor or infection is extremely important to identify early on. Uh, there's a lot of argument even in the literature, uh, in the clinical uh, perspective literature in lumbar and cervical spine about not doing imaging early. Um, 
and what you're going to miss. Now, for the shoulder, again, things are a little bit different. Path anatomy does drive prognosis a little bit more. So looking at, uh, we're not going to fully go into a discussion of red flag screening, but Mitchell in 2005 suggested a basic list of elements, including tumor infection, acute trauma, suggesting fracture and dislocation, and unexplained neurologic symptoms. In addition, uh, we added uh, visceral pathology because um, Goodman et al. in 2010 really suggested that this is extremely important, and I think we all realize that as well, because especially the gallbladder and cardiac pathology can refer to the shoulder, so it's important to include visceral pathology in this. Um, but again, tumor, infection, fracture, neurologic lesion, visceral pathology, all very important to screen out. Another thing that's important to screen out, and not necessarily preclude them from rehabilitation, but important to know, especially because it drives prognosis immensely, is yellow flags. So this is used to determine psychosocial issues such as a passive coping style, pain catastrophizing, fear of movement, and general psychological stress that can affect rehabilitation. And I think all of us in clinical practice, we know this. Specifically, these outcomes may affect outcome of care, how treatment interventions are delivered, and the specific uh, patient education strategies that are utilized. Patients with these factors also might be indicated for direct referral and treatment by other healthcare providers. Uh, it, in the literature, though, it's also noted that uh, high high scores on the pain catastrophizing scale and the fear avoidance beliefs questionnaire uh, is related to a longer recovery, chronic symptoms, and more work loss in patients with shoulder pain. These history and um, physical exam findings, though, are also utilized later on in, in <laughs> stages two and three in the pathoanatomic diagnosis as well as the rehabilitation classifications. I will say, you know, it, so you're not thinking that you're doing these completely separate. Um, just last month, actually, this article was published looking at a yellow flag assessment tool. And uh, when we get to it in the two slides from now, realize it is too small to see. It's more of an informational. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to read it fully. Basically, they took 136 different items from... Uh, from pain catastrophizing scales, fear avoidance scales, uh, and a bunch of other different components of psychological stress. And they boiled it down to 17 different items, which is really kind of nice. Um, they did find decent relationships between boiling it down all the way to seven items, but only about a 75% accuracy. Um, so this is the tool. It is in, in the... Um, uh, Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy last month, I believe. And uh, it is something that I'm going to start playing with as, uh, as clinically, um, just so I can get a little bit better numerical handle on some of, uh, some of my patients. All right, so moving on to pathanatomic diagnosis. Again, doing a history and physical exam, imaging as appropriate. These results utilizing those uh, specific specificities, sensitivities that we all know, or hope we know, um, to make the pathanatomic diagnosis. So first step is to verify that the shoulder symptoms are actually attributable to shoulder pathology rather than referral from another source, such as cervical spine or thoracic outlet. So distribution of symptoms, cervical spine rotation, range of motion, spurlings tests, and neural, neural tension tests are the most helpful in ruling these out, uh, especially for shoulder uh, cervical spine. And although there may be more proximal problems still amenable to rehabilitation, that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk. So I'm not saying you can't treat them with neck pain. You can this kind of uh, encompasses the four major categories. It, it's not all-inclusive, so please don't uh, think that it is. 
One of the issues with the individual pathogenic diagnosis from a non-operative non perspective is that boiling it down even further than this doesn't always help more. Uh, from an operative standpoint, of course it does, uh, as any surgeon would be able to tell you. But from a non-operative perspective, these are some basic categories. And again, as I had mentioned, it's not completely all-inclusive. So as examples, we have some key positive findings, key negative findings. And although there are uh, diag many diagnostic accuracy studies for the various tests and pathologies, there's considerable variation in findings among these studies. So the other part of it is the gold standard for all these is MRI or intraoperative intra visualization, which again is excellent for determining pathology. However, this is assuming that that pathology is the cause of the, of the pain or the symptoms that the patient is having, which literature has shown more and more that it does not necessarily correlate one to one. Again, pathology does help with uh, prognosis but it does not necessarily tell you that that is definitely the cause of the pain unless you fix it and they're all better and that's excellent. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. So examples in the passive motion deficits would be people with uh, adhesive capsulitis, glenohumeral joint arthritis, after post-fracture arthrofibrosis, AC joint arthritis. Key things in the instability category would be uh, glenohumeral anterior and inferior instability, posterior instability, multidirectional instability, and AC separation. Subacromial pain, again, overall category, but this could include rotator cuff tendonitis, bursitis, partial and full thickness rotator cuff tear, biceps tendinopathy, and labral tears. And just for completeness, the miscellaneous category is the other stuff. So peripheral nerve injury, myofascial pain, snapping scapula. Um, but again, that's the pathoanatomic uh, diagnosis section. So one of the primary intervention decisions made at this level is surgery versus non-surgery, of which non-surgical approach may include medication, corticosteroid injection, rest, and rehabilitation. This is an appropriate decision point uh, to make this decision because um, basically uh, operative diagnosis, operative decisions are made up based upon path anatomy. So the, the problem here also is though that these decision making decisions for surgery versus non-surgery sometimes can be unclear. And that's, uh, it, it's the subject of considerable debate in the literature uh, of present. And the debate is where, you know, acute or traumatic full thickness rotator cuff tears and recurrent glenohumeral dislocations in younger active patients and severe glenohumeral arthritis are usually pretty amenable to surgical repair, reconstruction, uh, operative management. However, some patients who are clearly with clearly proven tissue deficits with partial and full thickness rotator cuff tear also may respond to non-surgical intervention. So really there's it's it's hard to differentiate the two and at least from a large scale literature perspective you, there's no absolute for those. Uh, I would argue as a clinician that there are some but if you really look into the literature uh, it's not as clear. Oops, wrong direction. All right. Yeah, okay. Symptom irritability. Rehabilitation categories are based off of stage of tissue irritability to guide intensity of treatment as well as impairments. The concept of tissue irritability is the tissue's ability to handle physical stress 
and theoretically relates to the physical status and the degree of inflammatory activity present. Very specifically had this up here just to make sure that you saw it. It's a concept. And this is basically the framework for my um, dissertation. Three phases of irritability, which have been developed by consensus as of now, are operationally defined on this table. These irritability stages are meant to be mutually exclusive and, therefore, the primary means of classifying patients. The physical intensity of intervention can then be matched to the stage of irritability. And you'll notice, though, that there is intentionally not thresholds for what is high disability, what is moderate disability. The reason there's no absolute thresholds is because there are none in the literature. It does not exist as of now. And as there's been considerable debate among people in this room even, there is no one patient reported outcome that is the gold standard for the world for shoulder pain. Different groups have picked their own and different groups hold on to their own but there is not one specific one. Also, some of these uh, metrics have decent reliability, decent validity, but not perfect. So there's also a little bit of a problem. So at this stage, if you just stopped here, you could pick some higher irritability interventions, some moderate irritability interventions, some lower irritability interventions. That's great, that's wonderful. But it's not really going to help you pick which one is the best for your patient. And within each of these things, it's not going to help you pick which direction of force or what specific intervention to choose. However, it does at least help you with knowing whether or not they're ready for significant physical stress, physical stress because a higher, somebody with higher ability would not be. Therefore, treatment in the higher ability group would emphasize Activity modification, appropriate modalities, medication, manual therapy to relieve pain and inflammation, and only low pain, or sorry, low levels of physical stress by exercise. Patient education during this stage would typically emphasize how to avoid harmful stress while protecting the affected tissues and making sure that you provided stress to the non affected tissues. Treatment strategy for moderate irritability is control, controlled physical stress in the form of progressive manual therapy, mild stretching, motor control exercises, my, um, and basic functional activity. The low irritability group, now we can really get into the, the nitty gritty of those impairments. They're ready for progressive physical stress in the form of stretching, manual therapy, resistive exercise, and higher demand physical activities. So again, in nutshell, categorization at this level talks about intensity of intervention. Further specific guidance in rehab is based upon identified impairments that are deemed relevant because they're believed to either perpetuate the pathology or cause functional loss and disability. Now, it's important to note that these are not mutually exclusive, and they're really meant to hone in on that level of irritability. Because as I mentioned before, it's important that any classification system has mutually exclusive categories. So this is a secondary means of classification. And, sorry, and it is expected that people will have multiple impairments. And that also isn't as big as I was hoping either. So this table describes common shoulder impairments and associated matched treatments. This list is, again, the most common impairments, but I will argue that this is not absolutely complete. And that's okay. 
Identifying impairments is an essential part in the exam because patients with the same pathognomonic diagnosis and level of irritability may have differing impairments. And so you need to uh, intervene differently for those different patients. A little bit easier to see, but it doesn't include the treatment strategy recommendations. Tissue injury pain. So, and the difference between the first two categories is pain not associated with uh, tissue injury is more of the central sensitization aspect of it. Um, tissue in, pain with tissue injury is pain level that's consistent with uh, exam findings and consistent with the degree of pain radiation. And again, use clinicians all have seen the, uh, the not associated with tissue injury, I'm sure. Limited passive mobility. So whether they have uh, upper limb tension signs, limited passive range of motion in different directions, excessive passive mobility would be positive apprehension sign, posterior jerk test, increased accessory joint mobility in any direction. Weakness, decrease in force production. This is not talking about motor control because that's the next category because they're intervened differently. With aberrant mo movement or poor motor control, you're looking at scapular repositioning, scapular assistance tests, and it, you're looking at also for immediate improvement with verbal and tactile cueing. So these things help you identify these uh, poor motor control aberrant movements. So it's not just scapular dyskinesis, as some people will argue. It, it's beyond just the scapula. It's not just located to that. Functional activity intolerance. Well, do they have problems with specific activities? The last category is poor patient understanding. So one of the things that uh, literature has found more and more, and again, as clinicians, I'm sure you have realized this as well, that education uh, to your patient is almost more important than some of the interventions you provide. And this involves adherence to instructions, compliance, and understanding. So if they're not understanding these things, you need to do this more. And if they are, you need to do this less. Again, these are just the impairment classifications. So for an example, one patient may come with subacromial pain syndrome associated with glenohumeral laxity. And another patient may have the same subacromial pain syndrome with a posterior shoulder contracture. Stretching in very various forms would be great for the latter patient and horrible for the first patient, for the patient with glenohumeral laxity and instability. Just to illustrate the importance of those impairments. Likewise, two patients reporting high pain levels would likely be approached differently if the history and physical exam suggest actual tissue injury in one patient, type 4 slap lesion, versus in another person with just high fear avoidance and psychologic distress. So standard one size fits all, yeah, that's great, that's clean for research studies, and that's clean for teaching. That's not really the best approach for improving outcomes for your patients. This star system, the star classification system, it's founded with pathognomonic diagnosis and then expanded to aid rehabilitation treatment by classifying the irritability and identification of impairments. Although I've argued that it's important to go beyond that. I still want to reiterate that pathognomonic diagnosis is still an, es an essential element of this process and should not be left out. Consider, for example, three patients of primary impairment of limited glenohumeral mobility attributed by capsular changes. So patient one is 30 years old, eight weeks post-fracture. Patient two is 50 years old, early stage that he has capsulitis. Patient C is seven-year-old with chronic severe glenohumeral OA. 
they all have limited high, or limited mobility. Similarities, yeah, you're going to do some active and passive stretching, and you're going to do some manual therapy that's consistent with stage of irritability. Great. The huge difference is prognosis. The 30-year-old plus fracture is likely to recover in about three to four months. 50-year-old, in general, is expected to recover over one to two years. Again, this is based upon literature, not necessarily personal outcomes. Um, the 70-year-old with severe OA may improve, but if there's no improvement, they're likely going to be encouraged to seek surgical consultation. Also, both patients have subacromial impingement syndrome. Both have moderate irritability. Both have posterior shoulder tightness, scapulodiskinesis. But one has a rotator cuff tear, full thickness. The other does not. More than likely, the prognosis, or the prognosis is poorer in the one with a full thickness tear. And that one with the full thickness tear, if they're not making improvements, again, will probably be encouraged or should be encouraged to seek surgical consultation if they're not improving. Whereas the other one will be expected to improve a lot better. Hence, the patient management could be affected drastically by pathogenic diagnosis. So, again, I'm just reiterating that all three components are equally necessary. One does not take precedence over the other. So some really good things about this system is it's relatively simple in the fact that it utilizes terminology that can be widely applied. And if you really boil it down to absolute concepts, you more than likely can expand it beyond just the shoulder. However, this is very specifically designed for the shoulder. It also expands upon current uh, terminology and uh, rather than creating an entirely novel system, which there are numerous groups uh, throughout the country and throughout the world, especially in uh, rehabilitation professions that are trying to come up with different terminology to diagnose these patients uh, because of the insufficiency in non-operative care for just using pathoanatomic terms. However, the problem with changing terminology is then you have to learn a whole new language. And that really doesn't communicate well especially if we're utilizing this to improve communication. It's going to worsen communication. Limitations, though, it's conceptual. It does not have a whole lot of systematic research behind it. Again, that's one of the reasons for my dissertation, actually. And it also does not pertain well to central sensitization because that is a completely separate pain state that requires drastically different intervention uh, interventions. Um, and as of right now, the literature does not have specific irritability and impairment criteria beyond the conceptual stage. So future research need to find the reliability and validity of the irritability classification. Look at operational definitions for impairments and specific treatment procedures matched to identify those impairments. That's, those three initial aims are the aims of uh, my uh, doctoral dissertation. Additionally, we do need to find the validity of the irritability uh, levels and specific impairments, so really comparing matched versus unmatched care uh, to see if, if this really does result in the cost savings and improved outcomes that we anticipate and that has been found in cervical and lumbar spine. So the goal of this was to propose this classification system, make sure that uh, we understood the pathogenic diagnoses, the uh, treatment-based classification aspects for irritability and impairment it was to extend that pathogenic mo uh, model and to use tissue irritability to guide treatment intensity, use pathogenic model to guide prognosis, and use uh, impairment classification 
to guide specific methods of intervention. And again, I reiterate, this is specifically designed for the shoulder, but you could argue that the concepts can be utilized in other body regions as well. So again, the, the whole system looking at from screening, pathoanatomic diagnosis, rehabilitation diagnosis, resulting in optimal care. So, uh, some references. If, if you want to actually be able to read these, I can gladly print them out for you. What questions do you guys have? And anybody looking online, if you want to type in any questions, that's fine. No questions at all. Yes? Why do you think um, in the shoulder path anatomy matters so much more versus like, the lumbar and cervical? Why do you think that's a great question. I think it's the amount of mobility that's available in the shoulder versus the amount of mobility that's available in the spine. I also think it has to do with our greater ability to identify accurate pathology in the shoulder versus the lumbar spine. So some of it is just our over, overall inability to, to accurately identify pain-causing structures in the lumbar spine, um, some of that, and, and also the cervical spine, because there's so much in such a small area. And you could argue that there's so much in such a small area of the shoulder too, but our, our accuracy and our ability to differentiate between tissues is better in the shoulder. Um, Anybody else? Yes. I think it's, a, it's a really interesting concepts. You, I think certainly you kind of pointed out already that you have to dovetail in with the path of anatomy. Yeah. And, and the example of a chromioplasty is a very it's a kind of a poor example because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's very clear. 2016, there's multiple prospective randomized studies, Cochrane reviews, chromioplasty is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Medicare will not pay for it anymore because mm -hmm. of the, the data. So if you guys are seeing patients that have strict chromioplasties. That that's really not appropriate. In, in my experience, if they have subacromial impingement, it's not proven with non-operative measures. Okay, they all should. There's usually pathoanatomy that's causing that. I agree. Uh, degenerative change, partial thickness cuff tears, mm -hmm. biceps pathology, stuff like that. <clears throat> I think in the shoulder, compared to the lumbar and cervical spine, um, we're able to treat a lot more acute problems that are not degenerative in nature. The majority of lumbar spine and cervical spine problems are degenerative in nature. As you pointed out, it's a little bit of a different picture there. Um, and I think with this irritability scale, it's very, very important to identify what the pathonatomy is, if for nothing else, for the pairs. Because I don't think you're going to be able to provide care without being linked to an ICD-10 ICD diagnosis, and shoulder pain is not going to be sufficient. So, I mean, that's not the way we want to approach this stuff by what the pairs want, but it is a very, very important concept. And as you pointed out, it does help you with sort of like restrictions, sort of things to avoid, as you really, as you really pointed out, with the instability versus someone who has the same irritability that has adhesive capsulitis. I mean, they're completely different um, patho and anatomical disease processes that need to be approached differently. Although they may respond to irritability maneuvers the same, as long as you understand the underlying diagnosis. So I almost foresee this as being in addition to the mm -hmm. diagnosis, like a, like you know. Adhesive capsulitis A, adhesive capsulitis B, and mm -hmm. adhesive capsulitis C, like, mm -hmm. and then that puts them into the better framework for y'all to kind of understand where they are, what they would respond to initially. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like y'all know it. I mean, everyone knows these, what you're talking about, but this is a nice way to kind of classify it for communication. Mm -hmm. Without the diagnosis, the communication will break down as well mm -hmm. because they're completely separate. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a really cool concept. It's got a lot of, uh, of importance in how we approach these. And even post operatively. I, I know the Navy C post operatively as well. Yeah. We all know that. So, <laughs> um, I mean, it, you know, yes. it, and there's no real difference between a post operative shoulder and an acutely injured shoulder. So it's Correct. acutely injured. I mean, that's that's just the, so it's a, the same kind of concept. Yeah. Um, and they can take different approaches based on not just the pathoanatomy, but on the irritability. I think that's why you're adding a lot of value to this. So, Joe. Thanks. All right. Any other questions?
just to dovetail a little bit about what we were saying, I think we are using you know, the generic shoulder pain coding way too often, actually, from, <coughs> even from our from our 10,000 foot view network side of things. We actually started, everyone knows that CDC, we got classified again at CDC, and we're having to jump through way too many hoops to get authorized for more visits, everything like that. We're starting to look at some of the data that they sent back to us, and we're seeing that we're using, we, are, we account for 5% approximately of CBC's total authorizations that are sent to them, but we account for about 15% of their generic shoulder pain, or just the generic shoulder, the generic pain codes. And we account for less than 1% of the rehab codes. So I think that's where we need to you know, rely on our physicians a little bit, and also ourselves start using the, the diagnosis codes a little bit differently to make sure we're categorizing things and making sure we're getting the right ICD-10 kind of into CBC and on our mm -hmm. claims. So we are getting paid and not having to jump through as many hoops as we are right now. Yeah. yeah and I mean, you're sort of limited by the lack of you having the imaging, you know, for uh, certain diagnoses, but I think there's a lot of, and I see primary care doctors all the time, some people and people who diagnose the short pain. It's fine. My job is to figure out what that short pain's from. And I think of a, a, a lot of effort to make sure that my diagnosis is correct to help guide y'all in treatment, but also help the payer understand that this is indicated for this type of modality at this point. I think a way you can help the network do that is by identifying what you believe the diagnosis is and then communicating it to, them, to the referred physician in a very non-complicational way. Say, so, hey, you know, like for, and have a generic form thing. Capital Blue Cross likes to have a diagnosis for this based on your examination, our examination, this patient has several chromium pins. And it is, you know, so is there any way you can maybe update the diagnosis in the medical record, right? I mean, that, that is a way to help mm -hmm. match everything up, because I think it's going to be incredibly important going forward. Yeah. I mean, they're not going to pay for it. And, and, and also, you know, they're not really, yeah. you know, an assessment that the shoulder pain, no, no, no kidding. That's not, <laughs> that, that's not a diagnosis. Right? That's like, you know, Correct. It's like low back pain. It's not a diagnosis. Yeah. Exactly. And so, I mean, so I think it's pretty important to understand where and for all of us to guide their treatment. And mm -hmm. really the end of it is to get them the care they, they require to get better, right? And that's all. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we're being put in a position, or fortunately, we're in a position that we have to kind of bow down to the payers in order to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the hoops you're talking about. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, you know, internationally, everywhere but the U.S. utilizes the ICD-10 and the ICF, which is the International Classification of Functioning Disability, and I forget the other one. Um, but those that additional piece is extremely useful in actually providing a code for some of these things. In the U.S., we don't use that, which is problematic. Um, and, and you know, just like you guys said, we, we do need to be a lot better at finding specifics and really. Uh, identifying and accurately documenting the specifics in order to get reimbursement as well as to get the patients better. So ultimately, yes, they care about classifying. They also care if they get better too. So, Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.